Well, China has been mentioned more than once during the 2016 U.S. presidential election. Both leading candidates have leveled accusations at the country when it comes to certain trade practices, especially concerning steel. For more on how this is all being seen in China, we're joined live from Beijing by current affairs commentator Ina Tanjin. Good to have you back, Ina. Uh, good morning. Good evening. Now, from China's perspective, just how important are Chinese-U.S. trade relations to the economy? Oh, very important. I mean, they're, they're, they're each other's, uh, not each other's. Uh, China is uh, the U.S. largest trading partner. There's a, a huge amount of trade that is going in that direction. Unfortunately, the U.S. is not uh, in the same position with China. The exports to China have kind of gone down. But there, there's this kind of um, feeling of hostility between an, an entrenched power economically and, and politically in the U.S. and then and China as a rising economic and political power. Obviously, both candidates talking about China dumping cheap steel into global markets, especially when it comes to how companies compete. So what has the Chinese government's reaction been? Well, the Chinese government has been reducing capacity, but people have to understand something. I mean, when you look back at uh, the steel imports that were coming from China and South Korea during their heyday, what you have really is they, they installed the most modern equipment at that time. Today, if you look around the world, China has the most modern steel-making equipment. That doesn't necessarily mean they make the highest quality steel. It's simply that their cost per ton is lowest because they've uh, used the latest technology. Even when China gets rid of its overcapacity, it will still be a dominant player in this market simply because of the economics. Nothing to do with um, subsidies or anything like that, simply where it is until the next round and somebody else starts in installing uh, la uh, the latest equipment to do this. The U.S. has lagged behind. If you start looking at steel production and things like this, there have been very few new plants uh, that have been uh, created in the last 20 years, and that, that trend is not going to uh, change. So you're, you're seeing this kind of inevitable evolution of economics as um, new nations enter markets and old nations exit them. And speaking of evolution, we're seeing that China's growing middle class has contributed to a rise in imports from the U.S., but there's still a large trade imbalance between the two countries. How is that issue being addressed? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a market force uh, situation. As is said, a lot of the goods coming in from China are lower cost. If you were to do away with those, you would have a very severe impact on the U.S. You would lead to quite a bit of inflation. The, the difficulty here is that people are feeling that somehow something has been lost in the U.S. And they don't understand that the U.S. has a tremendous amount of exports. And if it were to kind of in, uh, engage in this kind of uh, protectionism, it would lose a great percentage of that especially to Europe. Uh, China is not the U.S.'s main competitor. It's the European Union. They produce everything that we produce, and therefore they're the ones who are going to be, be the benefactors if we do, in fact, go negative in terms of our trade uh, stance. Now, Clinton and Trump have both made it clear that trade deals will face much more scrutiny and, in some cases, outright rejection. So what would the Chinese government like to see from the next U.S. president in terms of the trade policy? Trade policy is very simply all, all they want is a fair playing field, and that's what both sides will tell you. There are issues involving uh, companies going from the U.S. to China and from China to the U.S. Both sides are, are, t are taking a look at how much of their capacity and market share should be going to uh, each other. But, you know, you have situations where uh, today Walmart or yesterday Walmart was saying they're going to invest $50 million in JD.com. These are the kind of things. They're trying to enter the market. They're trying to make a living. These profits would go back to the United States. These are the types of things that international trade is made for. A lot of the goods that Walmart uh, sells, actually, are made in China. So it's natural that they'd want to uh, figure out a way to make money in this massive new market that's going on. So a lot of this is just uh, theatrics. Uh, the right. truth is, the irony here is that you have a, a Democrat who's more in line with mainstream corporate uh, ideas than the Republican side. So that's basically the inversion that people are, are reacting to. And now speaking of investment, despite all the China bashing that we've seen this election cycle, U.S. states actually continue to welcome Chinese investment, with New York and California actually seeing the bulk of that investment in companies and real estate last year.
Now, do you think all this negativity we're seeing from presidential candidates could affect that trend? Well, I, I actually don't think so. I mean, this is the typical pattern that happens with an election. China bashing is a, is a you know, presidential sport. Everyone gets up there and says how tough they're going to be with China, how tough they're going to be with Russia, all of these things. But if you start looking at the U.S. deficit, yes, China is the largest uh, component of it, although uh, this last September you saw a significant decrease. Uh, but, you know, the other groups that are out there are Germany, Japan, Mexico, and Canada. If you start putting their deficits together, it starts equaling about 30 percent of the U.S. deficit uh, that they're currently running. The U.S. runs the largest deficit in the world, and it has been doing so for many, many years. Right. Uh, how those component pieces are put together is an economic situation. Well, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you so much for your insights. That was current affairs commentator Ina Tangent.